Hey everyone, welcome to the Forcecom Frontline. I'm Ashley and I'm your host. Today we have a special episode for you. In recognition of Women's Equality Day, which is August 26th and the day this episode is being released, we are talking with specialist Mara Spence Carroll, a soldier with Headquarters and Headquarters Company, 2nd Battalion, 23rd Infantry Regiment, 1st Striker Brigade Combat Team, 4th Infantry Division, and that's at Fort Carson, Colorado. Not only is Mara a soldier, she was also recently crowned Miss Colorado. She's the first active duty soldier to represent the state. Today she is talking to us about being a soldier in Miss Colorado, her work on spreading awareness and breaking the stigma of mental health care, and what led her to join the Army. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi Mara, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I have all the questions for you, <laughs> but uh, before we dive... <laughs> Before we dive too deep in the whole Miss Colorado title, I want to talk about your other title, which is U.S. Army Soldier. So how long have you been in the Army, and what is your MOS? I am coming up on three years in the Army in September, and I am a 35 Fox all-source intelligence analyst, and I'm currently stationed at Fort Carson. Can you talk about what you do every day to support readiness? Oh, absolutely. I So obviously basic soldier tasks, PT, motor pool maintenance, uh, PMCSing vehicles and things like that. But most of what I do in the office, because I do work in an S2 shop, is sending emails, uh, <laughs> checking security clearances, getting people account access so that they can use computers on base. Okay. Um, and then also setting up, if someone needs a reinvestigation, for example, I'll send up their paperwork and say, like, hey, this person needs a reinvestigation, um, things like that. It's pretty pretty mild compared to what a lot of other people do because it is an office job but it's just as important i was going to say just as important for sure i mean security clearances are definitely a big deal so absolutely important so what drove you to join the army and was this something you always wanted to do it really wasn't so i remember (laughs) specifically i have this vivid memory of being a kid and i must have been in elementary school and we had a navy seal come in to speak you know they always come in and do little talks about what the military is like and how to inspire the youngins. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how awful it was and how he was up for, you know, 36, 48 hours at a time and was <laughs> absolutely exhausted and, and was getting sugar cookied and smoked. And I was sitting there thinking like, I could do, no, I couldn't. No, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just, I was really taken aback by how cool it was, but also I was not a very athletic kid. I was super nerdy. I I used to play lawyer on the playground. Oh, that's funny. I was the kid. I was the kid who was always getting in trouble because I, you know, during English class, for example, I would, you know, finish whatever we were reading and then I would go back to reading my own book (laughs) to the point where my teachers would take my books away because they were like, you're not paying attention. I would have to be like, no, I did. I just, (laughs) I'm done to also read this. Yeah, I'm done. I finished it. And so as I got older, I just wasn't a very physically active kid. I was a kid that walked the mile. (laughs) And my grandfather was in the Air Force. So when he passed away in 2016, we were very close. I lived with my grandparents for a number of years. And it really impacted me. And so when I was 17, I was starting to think about what I wanted to do. I had just graduated high school. And I went to college for one semester. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not ready for this one in general. (laughs) Two, I can't afford this. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. So I needed something that would give me clear direction that would allow me to branch outside of my comfort zone that would pay for college. I think you see where I'm going with this, right? I do. And so I just was randomly on Facebook. I was also obsessed with Captain America at the time, which is a side (laughs) note, but that's part of what put like the army in my mind. And so I, I was scrolling through Facebook and my friend and mentor, Andy had a bunch of photo albums of her when, from when she was deployed, when she was in Qatar and like all these beautiful places and not so beautiful deserts. (laughs) <laughs> and I just thought it was so cool. And the line of thinking was, man, Andy is the coolest person ever. Andy was in the army. No, I wouldn't be like Andy. I would I would be in the army, but I wouldn't be cool. <laughs> Wait, but she maybe I could be like Andy and be cool. And so I started I started thinking about it, researched it for about five minutes. I was like, oh, no, I would never do that. And then the ads kept popping up. Because you looked at it so, once. Because <laughs> I looked at it once. So the algorithm was like, oh, you should do this. I called a recruiter I, about oh my gosh, November of 2017. And that's when I kind of made the decision. So I started telling people, but I did, I wasn't quite sure yet. So I ghosted my recruiter for a few <laughs> months. And then I turned 18 and I had kind of a meltdown where I realized, oh my gosh, I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want. You know, all the exciting things that come with turning 18. Yeah. And then I realized, oh God, 
I can do whatever I want. I'm an adult. I'm in charge now. And I had been thinking about it in the back of my mind for a few months, but it was honestly a spurred moment decision to be like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. And so that next day I called my recruiter who honestly did not expect me to ever <laughs> call him back again. And I said, I think I'm, I'm ready to join. And he's like, okay, come in tomorrow and we'll start the process. Okay. So I feel like a lot of people can probably relate to you to the fact that you said I wasn't athletic, you know, so when you went to basic training, not did you prepare? Like, what did you do to be able to get through basic training? See, everyone told me to prepare. And again, not athletic. So (laughs) I I don't know. Again, I was 18. So I wasn't the wisest. And I was like, you know, what? I'm just gonna go to basic and do my best. I'm just gonna wing it. And yeah, I was pretty much I'm gonna wing it I was you know flying by the seat of my pants <laughs> and I would tell my family that and they'd be like no you should probably go on a run <laughs> so maybe once every week I would drag myself to go run a mile or two and I would be dying right and hating every second of it <laughs> and so by the time I got to basic I was not in shape and I didn't realize until I got there oh god maybe I should have done a couple of push-ups before I came <laughs> here because of course during the shark attack they are smoking you right and it's awful. So I, I, I remember, again, specifically, we had to lift our duffel bags over our head, and I just could not get it. Oh. But no one else in my platoon could drop their bags until I got it over my head. So everyone immediately hated me. Oh, that's funny. Which is not, yeah, it's not the best first impression. Because they tell you, like, just do what everyone else is doing. Fly under the radar. I've never been good at that. I've always wanted to fly under the radar. Never done it in any one of the units I've been in. <laughs> and now and, you're Miss Colorado, not under and the now radar. I'm Miss Colorado, so it's even harder. <laughs> and I was on the verge of tears, and I finally got the bag over my head. The second that my arms were fully extended, our drill sergeant told us to drop them, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I need to, I need to do something." <laughs> so I don't know um, if anyone else had the experience. Excuse me, but during basic, they'll split you into three running groups. So they'll do a little like hat one, one, one assessment where you run a mile, do a minute, push up, minute, sit up. And based on my assessment, I was put in the C running group, which was the slowest running group. <laughs> and I remember looking at all the people around me and I was like, I don't think they're going to be fast. And I would like to be fast again. I don't know why I thought I was going to suddenly become athletic, but I decided I was. And so when they told us to get into our running groups one morning during PT, I just kind of slid on over to the B group. And I immediately regretted it because they were going at a much faster pace. But by the end of basic, that that drill sergeant, I still remember him. He was so motivating and was so, hmm, how do I explain? It was a little obnoxious at times because when you're just dying for breath and he's like calling cadence with ease, it can be a little frustrating. Right. But at the same time, it was like, well, I guess I just got to keep running. <laughs> I, I did become a runner by the end of basic. Well, so I, I was just going to ask. Time. I was done with that. I was going to ask, so do you run, run now? running anymore. No. Oh, no, I hate it. I do it. It's a, it's a necessary evil in my eyes now. I don't do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I know that I have to. Yeah. And I know that if I want to be able to do my job right, I have to be able to, you know, run two miles yeah. or run five miles or do push-ups. <laughs> there. <laughs> so, I mean, we're talking about the Army and basic training and running, and you're also Miss Colorado. And what stood out to me is that these things seem – totally different and they're on two completely different ends of the spectrum so right I also feel that they must help you each one provides something that helps you with the other though can you talk a little bit about that or do you have any thoughts on that oh absolutely I think that there seems to be that disconnect between Miss America and the army because people don't realize what they have in common which is understandable the people that are super into Miss America probably aren't going to be super into the military right right and vice versa so, I mean, there's there's four points of the crown, right, on the Miss America crown. Mm-hmm. Style, service, scholarship, and success. The most important of those to me is service. And then when we start looking at the Army values, one of the values is selfless service. And so that was the biggest connection for me. But also in the fact that when you're involved in Miss America organization or when you join the Army, you are doing a lot of really hard work with not a lot of immediate payoff. Yeah. Which I have ADHD. I talk, I'm very open about talking about it. So that's really difficult for those of us who have that, who have a dopamine deficiency. And so being in the being in the army just taught me that sometimes you're going to have to suck it up and just do the thing <laughs> that sucks and that you don't want to do yeah. because it's going to pay off later. Like going on a run today will help you with your run time on your PT test sure. or 
The reason we do PMCS now is because otherwise we'll be in the field and then your truck breaks down. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't know what's wrong with it. And you have right. to you know, go through a whole process. It's little things like that, especially with the Miss America organization. I've been involved for eight years. Oh, wow. I've been competing. I've been, right? I've been <laughs> competing since I was 13 years old. And I'm 21 now. And my goal was always to go to Miss America and to represent a state and to be able to do good and give back to the community and do all these things. And there isn't a lot of immediate payoff. You have to do a lot of hard work, a lot of practice, a lot of prep for a few minutes in which you're hoping for the chance of representing your state. That's and amazing that you you reached that goal. I mean, you set this goal. You wanted to go to Miss America and here you are now. I know it's it's crazy because, again, I never thought I was going to be the kind of girl who would get to go because I was told for years by people that, oh, my gosh, you're going to you're going to go to Miss America one day, blah, 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 which is I, I say it flippantly. I'm not flippant. I'm very thankful for those people. But at the same time, there are always people who would straight up tell me to my face, you're just not one of those girls who makes oh, it there. Yeah. And that honestly is a big I'm I'm a person who is motivated by I can't say spite so I will say the want to prove people wrong same so anytime I would hear that I'd be like well you know what I think I'm going to anyway and I remember same. specifically there's one person who I was 16 years old told me you know I had to manage my expectations because the women who make it to Miss America are tens and I'm just not a 10 oh wow and right and I was like you know what I don't think it matters <laughs> which apparently it doesn't because beauty, everything is subjective. There is no yeah. one ideal. And so maybe you don't think I'm a 10, but maybe someone else does. But also, why are we worried about whether I'm physically a 10 or not? Why don't we acknowledge right. the other things that I have going on? Absolutely. Which at the time I was struggling. But since then, I've worked super hard to build a life that I'm proud of and to be able to look in the mirror and say, like, I, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I stumble sometimes, but I'm still really proud of the work that I put in to become the person I am today. That's amazing. Um, so I was talking to one of my coworkers recently, really about you in this interview. And <laughs> I thought I was saying to him, you know, people I feel like can relate a little bit more with like the Miss America pageant and um, is pageant the right word? I'm sorry. Competition. Compe sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the Miss America competition, um, because we can see that on TV. Um, but when mm -hmm. you look at the army, it's a little bit more unknown. And so I feel like you're a really right. good representation or a really good ambassador for the American public who can see you know, the Miss America competition on TV, but doesn't really know anything about the army. Right. So that's and really I cool. It, I think it's a, I, it really is, but I've been trying really hard to show people what it's like, but at the same time, it's very boring. Like, <laughs> again, I work an office job. It's hard to make it exciting to be like, oh, I'm sending my seventh email of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's why I'm, I'm trying to show them like, here's me at basic. Here's me in AIT. Here's what I'm doing. I just went to the promotion board yesterday. I got my promotable status. That's so exciting. Kind of, Congratulations. Right. Thank you. That's Thank awesome. You so much. Very, Sergeant Spence coming. Very that is awesome. That. But I want to show people because I remember one of my, one of my other friends who is a veteran telling me, you know, I can tell you about the army and basic all day long, but it's really something you can't understand until you get there until you've been in. And yeah. once I got in, I realized what they meant because there's so many little things, little jokes, inside things, <laughs> all the acronyms, right. all of the little inside jokes and comments and the culture that you can't really distill down in a way that's easy to explain. And so the best way is to show people. Right. Because I want to, I want to show people what the army is like, because maybe there are people out there who aren't thinking about it, but might see what I'm saying and go like, oh my gosh, I think that would be a good idea for me because the army changed my life. Joining it literally made my life take a 180. How so? And ever since then, I have, oh my goodness, like I said, oh. not athletic, <laughs> not, okay. super, not super good at planning. I was very lost when I joined. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had a vague idea. I wasn't sure how I was going to do it. And being in has given me one, a lot of leadership skills has taught me a lot about myself and that I'm a lot more resilient than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I'm a lot more, I'm a lot, I'm a hard worker. I didn't know that because <laughs> ADHD and kids, I was used to being told like, oh, you're just lazy. You need to work harder. And you take that to heart when you're a kid yeah. in those formative years. So ever since then, especially since receiving my diagnosis and finding out, oh my gosh, no, I am a hard worker. It's just, 
I was in an environment where I couldn't I couldn't make myself work. Right. That makes any sense because executive dysfunction is really really difficult. Okay. But um, it just opened up so many avenues for me. It helped me figure out no, this is what I want to do and this is how I want to do it, and really helped me map out my life and set myself up for the rest of my life. So whether I decide to stay in and you know reenlist and go in for twenty years or if I decided, you know what, the reserves is fine and I'll just stay there for a while. Either way, I've been set up because I know more about myself. I know how to plan. I know how to be an adult because I basically lived on my own. <laughs> and I've grown a lot as a human being, as a person since I've joined. That's awesome. Um, do you think you might reenlist? Like, where are you at with that? I'm thinking about it. I'm not going to lie. So my, my ETS, as of right now, is in April of next year. Oh, so you have I a little I time. I want to go national. Yeah, I have a little bit of time still, but uh, my unit is deploying, so it'll be nice to be on rear detachment and really focus on Miss America and then also figure out what I want to do yeah. for Sherzies. <laughs> and <laughs> I think I want to go reserves or National Guard for now. Okay. Because I want to go to school full-time, and then I'm considering commissioning into the JAG Corps once I finish my JD. That's amazing. That's awesome. Thank you. So is that what you're going to school for right now then is to eventually be a lawyer? Yeah. Okay. So I'm currently majoring in communications and then I'll apply to law school. Awesome. So how do you balance Miss Colorado and being in the Army? So one of the good things about being Miss Colorado is that it's not as big a state as, for example, Tennessee or Virginia. Oh. No, excuse me. Or Florida. So it's not a full-time job. There are some states where they require you to take a year off school, a year off work, what have you, oh, just wow. to be a state title holder. Colorado isn't one of those states. And it also helps that when I do need leeway, like this morning, it's like, oh, I'm not going to be able to be in the office early because I'm doing an interview. Mm-hmm. They, they're they very willing to give me that time because I finished my tasks on time. They know that I'm not just skirting. They know I'm, I'm a hard worker. Right. And they're very supportive of me in my journey. I understand that I'm not successful just because I want to be successful. I am successful because I have people in my life and in my career field who want me to be successful as well, who support me and who enable me to be able to do things outside of just the Army, which is really great when we're talking about people first and, you know, the the way the Army is changing. Right. Acknowledge that even though we are soldiers, we have lives outside of work. You're humans, too. Humans. Human yeah. beings. Yeah. People. You don't have to just be a soldier. You can you can be Miss America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which And so it's been Oh, I just got chills. It's so weird. It's so <laughs> weird to think that you know, it's it's months away, it's in December, but even just thinking about the possibility of that is mind blowing. I can't so I exciting. can't imagine. I mean, to have been working towards this, something that for eight years eight years ago you said you had you hoped you would get to and now you're here. And that possibility is not that far away. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so sometimes I go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I was reading. So I have this one journal that I've had since I was 15 and I had written in it saying like, I don't think, why do I think I'm ever going to go to Miss America? I'm absolutely insane for thinking that I could be one of those girls. <laughs> and then I got to, you know, go back in a couple of weeks ago and say, you are, you're going, you're, you're Miss Colorado. You're going to Miss America. That's amazing. I feel like your story just sharing this has got to encourage so many other girls, so many other, I mean, maybe they're in the army right now, maybe they're, you know, 10, 12, whatever it is. I feel like you just have a really good story and um, are somebody who they can look up to. Thank you so much. Yeah. I just, I hope that I know there are a lot of people who are putting me on a bigger platform than I was before. And I just hope that I live up to the expectations that everyone has of me. Right. Cause I'm very conscious of the fact that, I am just a normal person. I'm just, I'm just Mara. Right. And I've done all these things again, because whatever you want to call it, because of hard work and determination or because of a little bit of luck, it's still strange because I feel like there's this tendency to especially place title holders on this pedestal that we really aren't on mm-hmm. because even though we've, we've done all these things, we've put in all this work and we've, you know, we, we just wanted to push ourselves Yeah. at the end of the day. We're regular people who decided that we would take the leap of faith and we would put in the hard work and, whether it works out or not isn't up to us. It's up to, you know, that panel of strangers who decides who gets the job. Right. But regardless of that, we're proud of the work that we put forward and we're proud of the fact that we pushed ourselves and that we wanted to do more. So I saw that one of your focuses on mental health um, and encouraging service members mm-hmm. to seek regular mental health care. Why is this so important mm-hmm. to you? I've talked about it a couple times already, but I have ADHD. Right. I was diagnosed thanks to behavioral health. Shout out Miss Jones and Dr. Knorr because... <laughs> 
I I thought I had it, and I did a lot of research, and I was like, nope, I definitely have it. And so I eventually started going to behavioral help just for general therapy. Mm-hmm. And then I started pursuing a diagnosis. I was like, I think this will really help me. And learning more about myself, learning how to work with my ADHD, being on medication, having a treatment plan has helped me tremendously. And so ever since then, I I realized, again, that I got super lucky and that I have a chain of command that's supportive of me receiving behavioral health. I have leaders who are willing to give me the time that I need, who are willing to give me the support that I need in order to better my mental health because that helps in my performance not just as a soldier, but as a human being. Absolutely. And so I want to make a point to say that even though we have a lot of higher level leadership that is saying, you know, mental health matters, you need to get people getting help because that's how we prevent suicide. We also need people at every single level understanding that getting help is good. It's beneficial. There is no downside to going to therapy. I think that everyone should go to therapy at some point in their lives. I could not agree more. Yeah. It's just good for learning coping mechanisms, whether it's you have some stress from, you know, everyday stress from having a family and job and things like that, or if you're dealing with other more serious mental health conditions, it helps you function better in your life. And why wouldn't everyone want to function better? (laughs) Right. So, I wanted to go back to the ADHD. And so you were diagnosed later in life. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people probably think that that is something that, well, if I'm 20 years old, I am i won't be diagnosed with that. Oh, my gosh. I was so scared of that, too, when I went <laughs> in, because there's a lot of stigma even within the mental health community about ADHD, especially. Yeah. And about how, oh, that's just a kid thing. And That's why there needs to be more education, more people with ADHD who are willing to stand up and say, I was diagnosed when I was 20. I'm in a support group. And we have people who are being diagnosed in their 40s and their 50s who are saying, oh, my gosh, everything makes so much more sense now because of X, Y, Z. And now I can function better. And it's a difficult balance between having to advocate for yourself and not being pushy. But we need people who are willing to advocate for themselves as well. Because when I when I went in and I said, I know I have ADHD I was pretty much willing to do anything to get a diagnosis just so I could figure out how I could make it better because I was at my wit's end at that point. Wow. And again, it just opened up so much for me because I realized that all of these little things growing up that I thought were me just being lazy or just not wanting to do work or not just being weird were actually (laughs) a dopamine deficiency. Right. And suddenly my entire life made sense. So why do you think that there is this big stigma around mental health care? It's something that we can't see. (laughs) And so it's really hard, I yes. think, for people to conceptualize the idea of mental health conditions. Yes. Especially when we talk about, you know, you sprain an ankle, it'll bruise and you know that it's it's sprained, right? Or break an ankle. Yeah. I don't, I'm not in the medical field, obviously. <laughs> or if you get a concussion, you can clearly see like, oh, their eyes aren't focusing and they're, you know, things like that. But with mental health conditions, I think that there's just so much that we don't know still because it's relatively new to look at mental health and yeah. to actually study it and try to understand it. And we also don't know a lot about the brain. Yeah. So that's, it's scary. It's an unknown for a lot of people. And that's why you will find those who are educated and who know more about it, who are trying to speak up and say, hey, this isn't something that isn't scary. You're just going to learn something about yourself. Well, and I feel like, too, and the thing that oh, sorry. Oh, say, sorry, you can go ahead. <laughs> so what I was going to say is I feel like we judge people for having feelings. Like, Mm -hmm. like you can't feel that way. Like that's not X, Y, or Z. You've got to feel this way. And why do we judge people on that? Who cares? Especially in the army. There's this idea that in order to be strong and to be manly, you can't show emotions. And that's one, incorrect and two, dangerous. Right. So at its lowest level, when we refuse to acknowledge people's feelings and say that it's manly, just, just just suck it up and keep going. You have people who are dealing with feelings they don't understand yeah. and who aren't willing to understand. And at your worst, you have people who don't understand their feelings. And so they feel like their only option is suicide. Right. Because that's really the the spectrum that we're talking about is you, you can have it from people who don't know how to deal with their feelings or emotions in a healthy way yep. uh, from people who, you know, just have anger management problems or who turn to alcoholism or drugs versus people who try to take their own lives. Right. And that's, that's, a readiness problem. That's absolutely a health problem yeah. as well. But when we talk about mental health, you know, I feel like there's a lot of conjuncture about, oh, well, we didn't have this in my time. We didn't have this back in the day. Right. Like, you didn't I've recognize it, but people were suffering more. 
Yeah. I think a lot of it too is self-awareness. You know, I, mm-hmm. I think you've got to look at yourself and say, and be honest with yourself. I think that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, when you go to the doctors and you answer that question about how you're feeling, it's super easy to say, yep, I'm good. I'm great. Everything's fine. It's actually being honest mm-hmm. with yourself that, oh, maybe I should check this box. Mm-hmm. And it's not just honesty, it's vulnerability. Yeah, that too. Which I understand people are very scared of, yeah. but vulnerability is a good thing. Yeah. There is nothing wrong with admitting that I'm not doing okay. I'm not feeling all right. Because right. if you don't open yourself up and allow for that vulnerability, you're not going to open yourself up for help, yeah. for treatment, and to feel better. Because yeah. that, that first step, that self-awareness, that admitting, no, I'm not okay, before it's a huge problem, is how you prevent it from being a huge problem. But right. people don't want to do that. Because, again, it's scary. It's something that's unknown. It's unusual. It's it's not the norm right. as, as a lot of people see it. Right. And that's why we need to make it the norm so that we can help people. We can help service members. We can help veterans. Yeah. I mean, so in my own personal experience, so after I had my second child, I had a lot of postpartum anxiety. And I can remember mm-hmm. the first time I picked up the phone to call behavioral health, I was in my car like shaking. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm doing this. I'm admitting that there's something going on. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Then you you get past that and you're like, oh, like I can feel better. So, I mean, it's a challenge. It is probably one of the hardest things that somebody has to do is to admit that. But at the same time, I think admitting it and helping yourself move to a better space is really important. Mm -hmm. And we can talk a lot about comfort zones in general, right? Yeah. Because... There's a lot of those, you know, motivational talks will say you have to push yourself outside your comfort zone. And that applies in all things. Yeah. Going to receiving mental health care, going to therapy isn't comfortable. I half the time when I leave my sessions, I don't feel comfortable. I feel better. I feel like, okay, now I now I understand why I do that or how to handle this situation. Right. There are, I mean, therapy has been, I've had sessions where it's really difficult because we have to get into some really deep rooted issues that I didn't even realize were manifesting in my life. Yeah. But by looking at it, being like, oh my gosh, that is why I do that. Again, self awareness to help me be yeah. self aware. And yeah. so being, we see a lot of people saying like, oh, well, I'm just not comfortable with that. I wasn't comfortable going to basic and, and running every single day, but I had to because it made me better. Yeah. There are a lot of things that I'm uncomfortable with, <laughs> mm-hmm. but you still got to do it. And there's, yeah, right. And there's this, you know, when we, we talk about, again, pushing outside of your comfort zone, why do we stop that conversation when it comes to mental health? Right. Why do we say, oh, well, you, then you want to be comfortable. You have to make yourself uncomfortable first, push yourself outside of your comfort zone right. to be better, right. to feel better, to function better. Right. And I mean, General Garrett says this quite a bit, but he says, and, and this isn't necessarily directly to suicide prevention or mental health, but he says you have to have uncomfortable conversations. And that's how we're going to fix things. And so that really kind of applies to this too. You've got to feel a little bit uncomfortable to get past that, to get to the next stage. Right. So, so because I'm, oh, if you, oh, sorry. No, again. you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say again that having those uncomfortable conversations is how we avoid an echo chamber. Yeah. Of the same, of the same thoughts, the same coping mechanisms, good or bad, the same ideas. And when you push yourself outside of that comfort zone, you open yourself up to a whole nother world of possibilities. Yeah. So what is your bottom line up front on seeking mental health care? Uh, do it today. <laughs> <laughs> today or tomorrow. Encourage encourage your soldiers, your peers. Even I would say encourage your leaders if you have that kind of relationship with them. Yeah. I know that in my shop, I can say like, are you okay? And, you know, check in. Which is awesome. Uh, which is good. That's and how it really needs to be. Yeah. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah. But I, yeah, bottom line up front, receive care, even if you don't think you need it, talk to somebody and be willing to push yourself outside of that comfort zone in order to feel better. All right. So we're going to switch gears just a little bit. So this episode is being released on Women's Equality Day. So I want to take some time to talk about, (laughs) me too. So I want to talk about female empowerment, which I think is a big part of the Miss America organization. So why do you think it is so important for women to support other women? Well, so the, the mission statement of the Miss America program is preparing great women for the world and preparing the world for great women. And that's so important, I think, because it allows us to remember that we're not just supporting ourselves, we're supporting a world. You know, we're building a world in which women are able to encourage each other and are able to cheer on their successes because yeah. there has been a lot of 
this assumption that women are catty and that they don't want to help each other. And that's just not true. Right. You know, we find in a lot of female centric circles, there is actually a lot of support. For example, the Miss America group chat I'm in right now, I told them I was going to my promotion board and they were sending me all these good vibes and, you know, prayers and things like that. And then when I told them I got my peace status, they were all so excited for me. Yeah. And it's little things like that and encouraging women, even if you don't understand what the heck a promotion board is, when you hear that your girl passes hers and is getting promoted eventually, you are excited for her yeah. because you want her to succeed. Yeah, I think and that's we important. Need, we, we need that. Yeah, absolutely. So can you talk about the process of preparing for a pageant and what that day is like? Oh, absolutely. So Miss, again, every state is different. For Miss Colorado, we submit an application saying we intend to compete. Here's our name, you know, basic information. And they go over it and they go, okay, good. And then we get to compete. So I found out in February that I was going to be competing for Miss Colorado, which was, oh, excuse me, which was super exciting because I had already picked out a dress. <laughs> I already had wardrobe ready. I knew, I knew I wanted to compete. So when I finally got the green light, I was super excited. And it was just a lot of get, you know, going to work, getting off work, going to the gym, um, or, you know, doing a talent rehearsal or doing a mock interview. I had walking practice. There was a dance studio that allowed me to rent out one of their rooms, and I used it for hours and hours and hours to practice my talent and practice uh-huh. my intro and practice my evening gown walk and practice doing an interview while looking at myself so I could get the feel for what I looked like when I was answering questions because I talk with my hands a lot, big yeah. hand talker. Me too. And, and I make faces. I do too, <laughs> all the time. I have expressive Face yep. is the problem. Uh, it's a blessing and a curse. Right. You get me. <laughs> I do. But it was it was kind of I, I kind of built up to it. So in March and April, I started you know working on my talent every day, and then doing an interview here or there, and getting you know getting my footing. And then in May is when we really started to ramp up because that's a you know, month beforehand before the competition, and so that's when I was about to go on leave. So I was still working full time. But I was also going to the gym, working on my talent, working on my interview, speaking to people, using social media, because we act as a kind of our own social media marketing team. Mm-hmm. And just just preparing myself, not just for the title, but for the job of Miss Colorado, because the title is really cool, but there, it does come with responsibilities. And sure. that main responsibility is community service, reaching out to people, meeting people, telling them what the Miss America organization is about and why we absolutely love it and why you should love it too. And so when I got to Miss Colorado, I had done so much work that I knew that no matter how I placed, I would be happy with what I did. And I kept that mindset since we're talking about prep, I'll stop right before I went to the interview room. But I just had that mindset right until I went to the interview room where I took a deep breath. I said some affirmations and I reminded myself that no matter what I said or however I competed I was proud of the work that I put in yeah so what was that like so I, I have a couple of questions <laughs> so I'll go ahead <laughs> again you had you had been this is something that wasn't just overnight eight years in the making basically um so when mm-hmm. you were crowned Miss Colorado what was that like for you I don't remember the first few seconds because <laughs> they called so it was my first runner up and I holding hands and they called her name as the first runner up. So I real so obviously I realized that I had won. Right. And I just completely blacked out. My knees buckled. Oh. And the next thing I remember, I was crying and I was like kneeling on the floor, looking straight at the ground. I was shaking oh. and I was crying. And Monica, who is Miss Colorado 2019, was crowning me and she had to actually help pick me up off the ground <laughs> and Instead of, you know, having a nice little crowning moment, the first thing I did was give her a big hug. And I went, it's been eight years. Oh, like, it took me eight years. How amazing. And, and then I was hyperventilating, apparently, because <laughs> <laughs> my director came over and gave me my flowers and said, breathe, you need to breathe. And I went, yes, ma'am. So if you watch my crowning video, you can see me say that super loudly. Oh, that's funny. Um, and then it, it just really started to sink in. Because I, I looked out and I think I was just I thanked the judges over and over again. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. I, I looked at my family. I was like, we did it. And uh. then I took my first walk as Miss Colorado, and it started sinking in that this dream I've had for so long has finally come true. That's so amazing. And all of the all right, and all of the work that not only that I put in, but my family put in as well. Right. Because it's I'll always say this is a team sport. I mean, it's finally 
worked out. And now my family gets to, to know that it was all worth it. All the long sleepless nights, stoning dresses <laughs> and, and my mom and I arguing because I don't like the way that she's having me choreograph my talent routine. <laughs> it's all worth it because here, here, here I was. You are. There she is, Miss Colorado. Oh, that's so Crazy. amazing. What a story. So what is your talent? I'm a classical singer. Okay. Very cool. Is that something that you've done for a while? Yes. So I started singing when I was very young. My mom was a Celtic musician. Ah, that's so cool. And she wanted me to write way cooler than I am. She (laughs) wanted me to start singing because she, you know, it's a family thing. And eventually she realized that I was not a Celtic musician. I was a classical one. Okay. And so that's when we started. I started, I got super into choir. I was in show choir. I just loved music. And I've, I don't, I don't do that as much anymore because, again, I'm not in the band. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm an analyst, but I still <laughs> love music just as much. So did you Irish step dance? I did as a kid. How did you? <laughs> I, did for, I did for two years. That's funny. And my mom's rule was I had to do it for at least three, and then I could do ballet because I always wanted to be a ballerina. Uh-huh. And then after two years of Irish Step, I was like, this is boring. I don't want to do this. I want to be a ballerina. And she was like, no, you have to do it for another year. I'm like, I don't want to do it for another year. <laughs> so I stopped. And then as I got older, I was like, why did you never put me in ballet? She's like, I told you from the get-go, you had to do Irish Step for a couple of years, and then you could do ballet. And you didn't. Like, you just wanted me to be an Irish Step dancer. And she's like, well, yeah, but I'm <laughs> That's you funny. fall in love with it. I um the town I grew up in we would have an Irish fest and so it was for St. Patrick's Day and um there would be Irish step dancers and I always loved watching them when I was little. I always thought I would do it and then I had a little girl and I was like, "Oh, maybe she'll be an Irish step dancer." But she really likes ballet, so that's where she's going. So <laughs> When I heard Celtic, I was like, Irish step dancing. Yep. I also have one of the most Irish names of all time. You know, I, yeah. People hear that, they're not surprised. They're like, oh, okay, of course you you took Irish step. And that's why I say the actual pronunciation of my name is Maura. Okay. My Irish friends and family, or my Irish and Scottish friends and family call me Maura. So I probably should go back to that because I know that I'm hurting their heart every time (laughs) I pronounce it incorrectly. But So I've got to ask, have you been to Ireland? I have not. I oh want to go gosh. so badly. It's amazing. Because my step, my stepdad's from Scotland. Oh, and I want to get there. My family, my family went in 2014, and they took my little sister, but they didn't take me, and I was really salty <laughs> about it. I bet. My mom's like, "You have school. Your four-year-old sister does not." I was like, "Okay." Oh. Um, yeah, Ireland's I'm amazing. Still waiting, waiting for my chance. <laughs> well, maybe if you get Miss America, you can go on a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so we're running out of time and I don't want to keep you too long. I know that you've got to get to work. So um, oh, you're fine. You were talking about going out in the community. So I'm sure in these going out, you have met a number of young girls. Um, what would your message be to them about following their dreams? Uh, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. I, I tell everyone that I talk to when they're like, oh my gosh, you're Miss Colorado. So, you know, you can be Miss Colorado too. And they go, what? And I'm like, yeah, you can do it. You just got to, you, you don't have to decide right now. But one day, whenever you want to, you can. You just have to put in the work and not give up, even when yeah. it gets hard. Yeah. Um, but one of the most gratifying things I will say is I met I met this family. I was at the Pikes Peak or Bus Rodeo the other week, mm-hmm. and there was this family of four girls from I think maybe the youngest was probably six or seven, and the oldest was maybe thirteen or fourteen, and they all looked at me with this just awestruck big smiles they were like can we get a picture with you (laughs) I was like oh my gosh yeah come on over I'll talk to you guys too they were like really I was like yeah of course oh it it's moments like that that make me realize that my job and and the the job of Miss Colorado isn't just about me and what I can get out of it it's what I can give to other people absolutely and especially the women that I know that are looking up to me that I don't necessarily think about all the time but that I need to remind myself of the fact that there are girls who are watching me yeah, and who are saying, well, if she could do it, I could do it too. And that's absolutely true. If I could do it, then you could do it too. Because I am just, again, a pretty normal person. <laughs> <laughs> I, were, I, I like to say I'm a normal person with a weird job. Yeah, And so if I can do it and if I can honestly go against the odds and do this while active duty, then I think that anyone can do it. Well, and again, I know we talked about this before, but you think of, you know, Miss America and pageants and, you know, gowns and crowns and makeup and, you know, the glitz and glamour of it. And then you think soldier 
and you mm -hmm. don't think so much glitz and glamour. You kind of think dirt or what, and I know you work in an office, but you know, when the normal person thinks about a soldier, they probably think about going out to the field and getting dirty. And so they just seem like they're right. on such different ends of the spectrum, but you're still doing them both. That's because that's the thing I keep saying as well, is that there is this tendency to try and put people in boxes, especially women. Yeah. Like, oh, this is your box and this is yours. And the box doesn't exist. Right. There, so important there is to know. No box. There was no box of I'm in the army and I compete in the Miss America organization. The box is just me, if anything. It's that I'm a soldier. I also am Miss Colorado and I'm going to be competing at Miss America. <laughs> I also love ramen. I love Naruto. <laughs> I love, I mean, there's all these different things. Every, every single person has a unique identity. Yeah. And so when we try to put people in these boxes, it's taking away from their unique identity because none of the things that I do exist in a vacuum. Yeah. They're all interconnected. Yeah. And Such that's the a great thing message. that I, I really want to, right? I really want to explain to people that it's really not that strange because these are just the things that I have an interest in. Yeah. And the things that you have an interest in might not be the same, but either way, neither of us are in a box. It's so important that message uh, on so many different levels. Um, you know, that could be a whole different conversation of just accepting people and whatnot, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> but is there I mean, any that could, be, that could be a whole other podcast? It though. could for sure. Um, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you want to talk about? You know, I I honestly don't. I always black out when people ask me that at the end of interviews. <laughs> They're like, should we touch any, on anything else? Like, I don't know. I think we did pretty good. <laughs> we did. Uh, if anyone wants to follow my journey to Miss America and my job as Miss Colorado, in addition to being a soldier, you can follow me at Miss America CO on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, Twitter and Instagram. And then at Miss Colorado 2021 Mars Spence Throw on Facebook. All right. Well, I know that we will be cheering you on and watching you to hopefully see you get that crown. Um, I can't wait to tell. Like, will it be on TV this year? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to watch at my house and I can't wait to tell my kids, hey, I quote unquote know her. I got to talk to her. So that'll be exciting. Are you, are you totally know me now. I, okay, good. So, totally I can, now. so I can tell my kids that I know her. <laughs> yeah. That'll be awesome. You'll so get some cool, cool mom point. Right. Well, I try. Um. I need a lot more, <laughs> um, but we will be cheering you on and we're super, ex I'm super excited for you. And I'm so glad that you took the time to talk with me. Um, this was really fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other time you want to talk about some other stuff, I can be funny sometimes too. <laughs> uh, and I will, I will gladly hop on and, and talk to you anytime you want. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. And whether this is your first time listening or your fourth time, we want your feedback. Let us know what you think or if you have an idea for an episode. Just send us a message on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And be sure to come back next month. We will have a special two-part series focused on mental health and suicide prevention. So in the meantime, like I said, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and catch up on all things Forcecom there. And we'll see you next time on The Frontline.